Welcome back to the programming. I'm Ryan Heath from Politico, and we're joined by not one, but two trade ministers now, Secretary Trevelyan of the UK and Minister Tan of Singapore. Uh, we apologize for the programming delay. We're just going to dive straight into it. Minister Tan, since it will be a US ASEAN summit this week, I'll, I'll start with you. You and other ASEAN members have been engaging with the Biden administration on their planned Indo-Pacific economic framework. Tell us what will be needed from Washington to make that meaningful for you? I think all of us uh, understand that the Asia-Pacific region, including Singapore, depends uh, very much to a uh, open and uh, secure, stable, as well as a rules-based uh, trading system for us to grow our economy and create jobs. It is therefore important for platforms like uh, Indo-Pacific Economic Framework to allow uh, countries in this region to come together, as well as US to come together to find opportunities for collaboration. After all, I think ASEAN and uh, as well as the broader Asia-Pacific region is going to be the key engine of growth uh, for many more years to come. It is therefore quite urgent for US to engage the Asia-Pacific region and important for them to develop a strong economic framework through this uh, Indo-Pacific economic framework to ensure that they are able to entrench their economic engagement uh, with the region. So we look forward uh, to this uh, uh, IPEF uh, in time to come. And uh, in order for IPEF to be uh, successful, it is uh, necessary for the framework to be inclusive, uh, to be flexible. Let me explain a little bit. Uh, to be inclusive means that it should be able to include uh, as many ASEAN members as possible. And some members may be ready, some member, members may take a bit longer uh, to adjust their domestic, uh, uh, to, to have their domestic consultation. And therefore it should also be flexible so that members can decide uh, uh, particular areas of interest to them. And when they are ready, uh, they, they can then join a specific uh, areas. Uh, therefore this uh, framework has to be flexible and has to be inclusive. So this is a key feature of the IPEF that I think will make it successful. And is it frustrating to be asked to join another process? Because we have CP, TPP, we've got the new Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership. So there are other processes and systems the US could be joining, and instead they're inviting you to be involved in a third framework. Well, I think we have to uh, understand that, that each country have their own uh, considerations and also have their uh, limitations and constraints. And therefore, we will need to find ways to work with different parties in, the, uh, in, in this arena. And uh, even within the uh, Asia-Pacific regions, we have uh, many uh, platforms for collaboration. ASEAN is one of them. And uh, we are having ASEAN Summit with the US uh, in a few days' time. And uh, this, these uh, various platforms will serve uh, different purposes and they will include their different parties. But I think collectively, it will form an inclusive and uh, rules-based system that will benefit all the participants. Great. Um, Secretary Trevelyan, I'll bring you in now. Uh, Global Britain is a very compelling slogan and framework for, for Britain's post-Brexit future, uh, but it's also a really tough geopolitical environment. So I was wondering if you can tell us how Russia's war uh, is reshaping the way you see and, and, and project Global Britain and where your membership bid for CPTPP stands. Thanks, Ryan. Well, yes, on CPTPP, to answer that part of your uh, question first, we're really uh, excited to have uh, made uh, the first part of the uh, accession program uh, go well, and uh, Japan invited us to uh, put forward our market access offer uh, in early March, and we are now in you know, that second part of the process. For the UK, uh, the Indo-Pacific tilt on that, uh, that move to being able to, as we're now free with our uh, trade policies to build uh, those trading relationships with those growing uh, growing economies uh, in the Pacific is really important to us. It's a, a critical part of the UK's uh, opportunities, which uh, we now have. Uh, we're really excited. We already have uh, now, you know, 70 uh, FTAs uh, plus the EU. And, you know, that's something like £800 billion pounds of uh, UK bilateral trade last year. And that's great. But actually, CPTPP opens up uh, so many new opportunities uh, for UK businesses uh, and we're you know, really excited about that. I think to your point about uh, the disruption uh, that the uh, uh, unprovoked and illegal war that uh, Putin is raging against Ukraine, the disruptions uh, that, that that has wrought and the demonstration of why uh, having trading partners who are uh, reliable with friends and allies 
uh, speaks more than ever to why we want to be building those trading relationships with our Indo-Pacific uh, friends and neighbours so that we can have uh, more secure and broader resilient supply chains uh, for our businesses and indeed so that we uh, can provide the sorts of uh, the sorts of goods and services uh, to those countries where we know we want to be working together to ensure that free and fair trade uh, can continue despite, despite uh, the disruptions. Obviously, we're also looking uh, at bilateral trade activities with a number of the CPTPP family as well, as we continue to try and build, uh, build those uh, closer trading ties. Because, you know, as we know, you know, trade is between a willing uh, buyer and seller, but it's also a demonstration uh, of trust in that country of working together, uh, mutual recognition, all those issues which demonstrate what is so important when you see the disruption the system like Russia has created today, uh, that actually we want to be working more closely than ever uh, with those friends and allies around the world. Uh, one of those trust issues, one of those elephants in the room is obviously China's rise. Uh, and the way it engages with the world. Uh, the US Chamber, our host today, put out a big study last year, uh, really warning against decoupling from China and the costs of that. Uh, I wonder how you see those dynamics. That's a question to each of you, but I'll, I'll, I'll let you go first, Secretary Trevelyan. Thank you, Ryan. So, you know, we have a very uh, substantial trading, bilateral trading relationship with China, and uh, it's very good, and our businesses want to continue to grow that, and we support that. What we always want to make sure that we have uh, is a framework of free and fair trade uh, that works uh, for both sides. Uh, and uh, we want to continue to have, you know, an open and healthy uh, Chinese trade and investment uh, bilateral relationship. So we will uh, continue to do that. And, you know, my department works obviously very closely uh, with businesses. So if a market access barrier uh, uh, is something that we need to be looking at, uh, it's Department of Inter you know, International Trade that will be doing the uh, detailed work uh, with uh, that other party. So that's really important. But, you know, on areas like, uh, you know, the questions of national security, freedom, and responsibility, there's some of the challenges that we see and that businesses are challenged with in terms of uh, forced labour use. You know, those are issues that we will continue uh, to want to raise, as we did with any any country where we trade, where we think there are uh, certain certain issues which are not uh, you know, uh, okay as far as the British people are concerned. We will continue to do that. And of course, the Foreign Office has a, an ongoing role in that. But our relationship, our economic relationship with China is very strong. And uh, I continue to discuss with businesses all the time uh, how they can grow uh, their markets because there are, you know, huge opportunities there for our businesses. Minister Tan, Singapore, obviously, is a very small, though prosperous country. Uh, how much of uh, the shadow of China drives your need to engage with the U.S. through through processes like this new economic framework? I think um, Singapore, as I mentioned, is uh, um, plays a lot of importance of in on the free and open trade and uh, multilateral rules based uh, trading system, and uh, we are also very uh, critical in terms of. Uh, 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 ensuring the supply chain resilience. Uh, but with the recent uh, events, uh, including the tension between US and China, has caused many countries to think about uh, uh, onshoring or reshoring some of their manufacturing uh, 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 capacity. And as you uh, rightly pointed out, I think this uh, 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 the outcome of uh, some form of uh, decoupling is going to be very costly for everyone. I think in that scenario, no one is going to be the winner. So I think it is better for us to continue to pursue multilateral cooperation among uh, many uh, uh, trading partners, uh, uh, like, like uh, Minister Trevor Lyon mentioned. I think it is important for us to continue to do so. Uh, but I must say that uh, a stable environment where we can all thrive together and cooperate together is the ideal. Uh, but unfortunately, this ideal is increasingly becoming more difficult to achieve. But I must say that uh, we should not give up hope. We must continue to work hard and Singapore will continue to strengthen this uh, open and inclusive rules-based multilateral order in pursuit of uh, global prosperity and peace. Uh, one element of trade where this becomes very concrete or could be very alarming very soon is trade in food, um, where there are literally millions of lives on the line. Um, and we've seen some countries move towards some, what I would call damaging export restrictions or protectionism 
They're driven by wanting to protect their own people, but the effects could be very severe around the world. Singapore is obviously an example of a country that has to import most of its food. Um, but my question is to both of you, um, what, what can you do as trade policymakers to sort of ease those strains around food security and avert a big wave of global hunger and, and possibly famine? Well, maybe uh, Minister Pravlayan would, would like to uh, go ahead first. Thank you, Ms. Gann. So I think um, really importantly, the UK and the US are working very closely together um, to really support those open uh, predictable rules-based agricultural trade routes uh, to try and help mitigate some of the supply chain disruptions uh, and make sure uh, that we can restore global food security, uh, which has been you know, very severely imperiled by Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine. So we are working very closely together uh, through the current crisis uh, and, you know, indeed wider issues that are therefore impacted uh, across our agricultural supply chains as a result. So make sure that we are uh, trying to build more resilient, um, more efficient and sustainable food systems, uh, which will be uh, more prepared against future shocks. Um, in, in the short term, coordinating with other international partners, the UK and the US, uh, have already adopted you know, unprecedented economic and financial sanctions against Russia uh, and will continue uh, to apply uh, pressure in every area that we can to reduce Putin's ability uh, to continue uh, this war. Because of course, uh, we need, you know, Ukraine as described as you know, the basket uh, of the world, there's such an important part of their, uh, their contribution to, to food security through oils, through uh, wheat and others that we need to uh, find ways to stabilize that and to help them to be able to plant uh, and to be able to uh, export uh, their goods. So we are working uh, very close together and indeed um, we'll be seeing a joint statement uh, on open and predictable trade uh, in agriculture and food products uh, next week at the WTO um, from uh, the UK and I hope another 50 or so countries uh, to really uh, set out how important those open and predictable agricultural markets uh, are, and that trade is key to mitigating both the short and indeed the longer term challenges around food security. And we want to uh, do more uh, as we need to. And obviously as we come uh, towards the um, uh, MC12 uh, in June, we will be, I'm sure, uh, discussing how in a practical sense we can help uh, both Ukraine uh, maximize its food production, but how we can ensure that the world, secure, world food security challenge is, is mitigated as best as possible. And is that practical discussion not shelved, but do we have to wait until June for that? I'm thinking practicalities around the port of Odessa, for example, where this situation is a great reminder that trucks can't replace what you can get out of ports um, if they're not functioning. Uh, well, indeed, and you know, the challenge is always, as you say, shipping in different ways. Difficult. So there are ongoing discussions uh, a number of countries working closely with Ukraine to help them think about how we can help them manage their trans logistics uh, in the short term and indeed the medium term, because some of the damage to, to ports there will have you know, long term uh, recovery programs once uh, the war uh, ends. So uh, there are ongoing discussions now about that uh, between you know, a coalition of the willing to, to support Ukraine. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, Minister, did you want to reply on the food question? Thank you. Maybe I just uh, make a few quick points. Uh, uh, thanks, Ryan, uh, for this question, because uh, for, for Singapore, this is very close to our heart. As you mentioned, uh, we, we import the majority of our food stock. So for many years ago, we have started this uh, on this journey of a supply chain resilience for our food supplies, as well as our medical supplies. I think we learned a very painful lesson during the pandemic uh, that uh, the vaccines and medical supplies, uh, including masks, uh, were disrupted because of supply chain constraints. And therefore, we have uh, put in place a lot of measures to ensure that our supply chain is resilient. This includes a diversification of uh, sources of supply, so they were multiple sources, so, so that we are not uh, dependent on any particular single source. And on top of that, it is also very critical to maintain a connectivity uh, throughout pandemic, throughout crisis, even uh, with the uh, uh, outbreak of the uh, Ukraine war, it's important for us to maintain our connectivity with the rest of the world. Uh, during the pandemic, we have kept our ports, seaport and airports open uh, throughout the pandemic to ensure that goods 
critical goods can continue to flow, including uh, essential food stuff. And I think Singapore uh, will continue to play that role, not only to meet our own needs, but as well as uh, to serve as a hub for uh, the supply of foods in this region, as well as for uh, the rest of the world. Um, Secretary, I was struck by your phrase, coalition of the willing around some of those issues. And it reminded me of how fragile the WTO is at the moment. And I was wondering uh, how much hope you have for uh, substance coming out of that consensus-based system, or are we really going to need to, to some other system or platform where you don't need uh, a 100% majority to get things done? So I think uh, some of the challenges that WTO has been facing uh, have proved uh, difficult to move on, but you know we uh, look at the changing you know growth in economies over the last 20 years. The WTO uh, needs to be uh, you know fit for purpose and moving forwards to support all those countries who are trading and you know the relationships beyond you know not beyond any goods to services and those wider uh, questions to make sure that it does you know, what it says on the tin, which is to support free and fair trade and to support uh, all countries who want to be uh, part of that global trading uh, activity. So I think there's, uh, uh, there'll be a lot to discuss uh, in June. Uh, and I think there is a very strong uh, focus of wanting to make progress. How we do that in some of those intractable areas uh, will be, you know, and I think, you know, sadly, the, the realities of seeing uh, the war in Ukraine and, uh, you know, where uh, one country has decided to, you know, behave in the most uh, outrageous and legal fashion and the disruption that causes will, uh, I hope, bring everyone uh, to the table to think about how we can work together um, to find solutions to these big challenges because, you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, food security, fair trade, uh, the opportunities for uh, countries to grow and to see their economies become stronger and therefore be able to look after their citizens better is uh, what it's about. So we want to make sure that we have those conversations. I'm sure it will be very frank. Uh, I've yet to find WTO meetings that aren't, uh, either in plenary or indeed not, but that's really important, I think, really important, because more than ever, actually, we need uh, you know, the WTO as an anchor for uh, those values, uh, that is so important to the UK and to so many uh, nations uh, are able to be uh, known to be reliable and indeed the WTO will support countries that follow uh, the right path. So I think it'll be I think it'll be a lively meeting and I hope that actually you know if there are any silver linings to the horrors that are going on in Ukraine that it will uh, afford the opportunity for us to look very honestly about what uh, free and fair trade means in practice. Minister Tan, do you share that level of uh, faith that the WTO is still useful? Uh, absolutely. I think it is important for us to continue to preserve this uh, multilateral rules-based uh, trading system. Uh, we mustn't forget that the WTO has uh, served us well for many decades in uh, uh, fostering trade and uh, um, uh, uh, driving economic growth globally. And uh, there are challenges and the uh, uh, Ukraine war and the pandemic has in indeed uh, uh, clouded outlook for uh, MC12, uh, but I'm hopeful that uh, this um, MC12 meeting will give us an opportunity for us to think uh, deeply, to engage uh, with one another, to really contemplate how WTO needs to evolve, to continue to be relevant, to remain as a, on one hand a consensus-based uh, multilateral system, on the other hand able to deliver results. I think we are exploring uh, various uh, possible modalities, various possible approaches, one of which is what we call the uh, Joint Statement Initiative, which allows a group of a uh, coalition of willing, as you mentioned, uh, to come together. Uh, those who are ready and be pre are prepared to move ahead, uh, they can then uh, introduce these initiatives. And as a, as a sort of a pathfinder uh, arrangement and other uh, uh, countries or economies who are ready to join, uh, we should keep it open for them to join in. This way we will preserve the multilateral nature of WTO, but at the same time, allow the coalition of willing to be able to make progress. I, I think this is one uh, modality that we are trying it out. And we have already seen some results in terms of the JSIs for uh, domestic regulation, investment facilitation, as well as e-commerce, which is very important for us. Great. 
Uh, we've got about a minute left. A couple of quick final questions to you, Secretary Trevelyan. Uh, I know the UK has been uh, engaging, negotiating with several individual US states. I was wondering if you have any news or thoughts on which states hold out the most promise for increased trade with the UK. And then I noticed um, we didn't hear about the Northern Ireland protocol, the Brexit related protocol in the Queen's speech to Parliament today. So I was wondering if you uh, can offer any assurances there about the UK government sticking to that policy. So uh, we are continuing to work at pace uh, on a state by state uh, discussion on a number of areas of, uh, you know, mutual recognition of a number of things. And I think that's going really well. I'm looking forward uh, to catching up with uh, Ambassador Tai to talk about uh, SMEs in a deep dive for our next uh, trade dialogue, uh, hopefully in Boston very soon, which will be great. Uh, so we are really looking at how we can help our UK businesses to build on that already amazing 200 billion bilateral trade relationship uh, in ways that uh, we haven't before to take away, strip away uh, market access barriers of, of all sorts, not only tariffs, of course, which would be a federal area. So uh, there's a lot uh, going on. And in the Queen's speech, there was uh, one uh, particular, well, two actually, one reference in, in referencing obviously the uh, work that Brandon Lewis has been doing uh, on veterans. And uh, there will uh, shortly be a bill coming in on that, which is, I think, a very, very good an issue that's been long overdue and getting solved. But also uh, a very clear reference that uh, this government continues uh, to be focused on sustaining and supporting uh, the values and the stability of the Good Friday Agreement and that we will do all uh, we can and need to do uh, to make sure that that is uh, the key element. And I think uh, we are all, from whichever uh, political aspect, I think everyone wants to do that. So that will continue to be uh, the Prime Minister's focus as we uh, move forward to continue those discussions to find ways to uh, solve the challenges that some of the trade diversion that we've seen as a result of protocol can be resolved. So that will be an ongoing discussion. That's very clear. Secretary, Minister, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we really appreciated the conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Good night.